Good morning, students. I'm Dr. S J K. I'm here to discuss about the Einstein recall ENT questions. From the feedback of the students, I heard that though the general standard of this year's Einstein was having a mixed response, ENT is generally having a good positive response that it is comparatively easy, was easy to answer, like that many were saying. Okay. With that note, we'll start with the questions. We we'll start with the easy questions. Which of the following signs not seen in allergic allergies? The first one is allergic shyness, allergic salute, auto baragut fold, denim organ fold. So the name itself implies it's already having allergic shyness, allergic salute. So due to chronic sneezing and running nose, the patient will be having a reddish or blackish discoloration over the lateral aspect of the external nose. That is called allergic shyness. Okay. Then, under the eyes, the patient will be having some, some blackish discoloration that is called Denny Morgan fold. Okay. So, the answer is Otovaragut fold. Basically, what is Otovaragut fold? It's nothing but it is in chronic depression. So if the one side upper one side eyebrows gets changed like this because the depressed patients will always be frowning like this, frowning, frowning. So one eyebrows will get changed like this. This is called auto varagut fold. Okay? It's called auto varagut fold. It's an easy question. Okay, so you should know the auto varagut fold. That's fine. Right? Yes. Next question. Again, an easy question from nose. 30 year old boy with right side nasal obstruction, recurrent epistaxis in six months. What is the probable diagnosis? So it's easy question. 13 year old boy, adolescent, right side nasal obstruction, epistaxis is recurrent. It's obviously a case of Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So coagulation disorder, they have not, they have not given anything about the PT, CTR, APTT, INR, whatever. So we that's not the case. Anthropoid poly, no obvious epistaxis. So the age may favor this diagnosis. Anthropoid poly will be having only nasal obstruction, no epistaxis. Okay. Allergic nervous, of course, would be having some allergic symptoms. No epistaxis. All right. So we'll we'll discuss some points about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is nothing but a benign disease which is encapsulated. That is forming over the nasopharynx. It mostly affects the adolescent males. It affects the adolescent males. The patient will be having a profuse epistaxis. The patient will be having nasal obstruction and frogfish deformity. The commonest site of JNA is. Sphenopalatine from okay. So common site of carcinoma nasopharynx is fossa frosomular. Common site of JNA is sphenopalatine from. So why it is affecting only adolescent males? What is the hormone that is responsible? Is none other than that. Testosterone. So there is a staging that they may also ask called Ratkowski staging.
So this Radkowski station is mainly dependent upon the anatomy of pterygopalatine fossa. Okay. So anatomy of pterygopalatine fossa. First, if it occurs over the nasal cavity, or nasopharynx, it is 1A. 1B is involvement of paranasal sinus. So this is a pterygopalatine fossa. So if it is involving only one third of pterygopalatine fossa, it is called 2A. If it involves more than one third of pterygopalatine fossa, it is 2B. It involves the entire area of pterygopalatine fossa, it crosses the pterygopalatine fossa, it enters into the infratumbral fossa, it is 1, 2C. Okay. So less than one third of pterygopalatine fossa, 2A. More than one third of pterygopalatine fossa. Beyond the Three A is involvement of skull base. Three B is nothing but cranial cavity. So investigation you could you should take a contrast in the CT of paranasal sinuses. Okay. So you will see. A sign called Holman Miller sign. It's nothing but pushing of the posterior wall of the maxilla is called Holman Miller sign. Pushing the posture of maxilla angle is called Coleman Miller's. And also, you could take a CT angiography. So, treatment is surgical excision, either endoscopic approach. open approach so if you're having stage 3 a 3b you could do so inoperable tumors you could give radio therapy as treatment so that's all the points about Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Right? Next one, a question from here. Which of the following intervention should not be done in eight year old boy with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss? Now, the patient is having a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, which is obviously a congenital. Deafness. The child is having congenital deafness. Either you should try a cochlear implant or you should give a hearing aid. Okay. So he's 
he has been put in a normal class so he should be asked to sit in a front row all of them are correct with respect to a congenital deafness which is a sensory neural hearing loss this adenoidectomy with dromal insertion is the treatment for bilateral conductive hearing loss not sensory neural hearing loss bilateral conductive hearing loss is nothing but serious motor dysmorphia motor dysmorphia with effusion So, ironically, next question is also asked from serious otitis media. Which of the following is not associated with otitis media infusion? So, serious otitis media is nothing but a disease where there is East Asian tube dysfunction causing fluid inside. Middle ear cavity. Okay. Now, what is the reason for this e station to dysfunction? So, first one is. adenoid hypertrophy in children second one is carcinoma nasopharynx in adults so these two are the etiological causes for serious otitis media or otherwise called otitis media with effusion so what will be the symptoms the patient will be having conductive hearing loss intact pm with fluid filled middle ear it importantly shows type b go flat go type c curve is a so early sfoem will be having only east asian tube dysfunction so that will be having type c curve late sfoem will be having type b curve so if you don't want to confuse yourself the question which they may ask it will be having only type b curve okay so having only type b curve so type c curve some twisted question may have this response but mostly you should think of only type b curve so flat curve seen in late as well treatment is it good adenoidectomy with traumat insertion adenoidectomy with grommet insertion this is the adenoidectomy with grommet insertion picture okay
Okay. Next question is about obstructive sleep apnea. A 40 years old obese man with disturbed sleep, daytime somnolence. Okay, if there is disturbed sleep and daytime in somnolence, why complaints of uh, snoring during sleep? This is the following effect. So apnea with awakening, apnea with foreign sensation, apnea with hypercapnia. So whenever there is an episode of obstructive sleep apnea, there will be either an apnea episode or hypopnea episode that makes the patient to go for reduced, increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide, reduced SpO2 and ask the patient to awake. So all these responses are correct with respect to obstructive sleep apnea because the patient is having disturbed sleep and daytime sleepiness it is obviously the patient is having a higher grade of apnea hypopnea index. OSA you should know about apnea hypopnea index. So, so, it is calculated by number of apnea and hypopnea episode the patient is getting while sleeping. Okay, the patient is getting while sleeping. So, what is the classification of this apnea hypopnea index? Number one, less than five episodes is normal. 5 to 15 episodes, it is mild degree of apnea hypopnea. 15 to 30, it is moderate. More than 30, it is severe OSA. So, this is the first thing you should know. Okay. So, symptom was seen. If there is only severe OSA means the patient or my moderate OSA means the patient will be having very tired look, daytime sleepiness, and all sort of symptoms. Okay. Now, what about the last option? What is the pathophysiology behind OSA? So, what is actually happening? This is a normal uh, person who is sleeping. The oral cavity and nasal nasal cavity is always free to move further into the oropharynx and nasopharynx. Whereas in OSA, the tongue will fall back. Okay. The pharyngeal dilator muscle The pharyngeal dilator muscles will fail to constrict okay. so that will become a lax airway. The airway becomes very lax. So that lax airway will block the pathway. That will create turbulence of the airway that is causing snoring. Okay. And sometimes the, the turbulence may be very severe. The block may be very, very much obvious. That will cause a patient to awake from the sleep. Okay. So awakening from the sleep and Turbulence which is causing snoring, these are the pathophysiology behind the OSA. So, pharyngeal muscle contraction increases OSA, so contraction can't increase the OSA. Okay, so dilator muscles, it is not dilating, if it's not acting properly, if it's not working properly, that will cause OSA. So, this would be the correct answer. The basic thing is so pharyngeal dilator muscles, it is not it's not working correctly. Okay, so, so that is the main thing. So, structures passing between superior and middle constrictor. So, it's an easy question. It's a question from anatomy. So, we are having some spaces between the constrictor muscles. So, there is a space between superior constrictor and skull base, between superior and middle constrictor, between middle and inferior constrictor, then below the inferior constrictor. So, what are the gaps and what are the structures that pass between these structures? We'll see. So, between the superior 
constrictor and base of skull we are having a sinus called sinus of morgagni so through the sinus of morgagni there will be auditory tube which is an east station tube there will be liberator valve palatine muscle ascending palatine artery palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery so if the what are what is the other mc2 corresponding to this this particular sinus of morgagni is if the carcinoma nasopharynx involves this particular space it got costus tortest its lateral temporoparietal neuralgia palatal palsy then conduct the hearing loss due to east station to dysfunction or serious otitis media so what is this it is nothing but protostriate if the carcinoma nasopharynx involves the sinus of morgagni it will cause this corresponding symptoms all right if the space between superior and middle constrictor we will see stylopharyngeal muscle and glossopharyngeal nerve stylopharyngeal muscle and glossopharyngeal nerve between the middle constrictor and inferior constrictor you will have internal laryngeal nerve or otherwise called superior laryngeal nerve internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve superior laryngeal vessels so these all will pass through the space between middle and inferior constrictor below the inferior constrictor you will see recurrent laryngeal nerve and inferior it's very easy so superior superior laryngeal vessels recurrent and inferior laryngeal vessels the third the stylopharyngeal and glossopharyngeal is the question they have asked the answer for this question is spacing between superior and middle constrictor it is stylopharyngeal muscle okay so six questions were asked from ent so i'm always telling number of questions they were asking from ent has been on the study rate increase and also they are not asking any factual question they are asking some conceptual question from ent if you know some of the basic concepts in ent you could easily answer the questions from ent so please pay attention for ent it's an easy subject so it is again going to fetch you a lot of marks in neat exam also so happy learning students thank you